I don't know if you still do this or not, but you would release your financial statements. Like you would show people exactly like how much money you were making and stuff. I did. I did that first in October of 2008 because I wanted to show people, hey, here's my yeah. architecture business. Here's how many of this product that I made we sold. Here's how much we're making from the advertising. You can do it too. Look, I did it. I'm I'm just a regular guy who figured it out. And now I want you to try this on your own if you want to try it too. Uh, and I did that because I, for two reasons. Number one, I was like, if I'm going to teach this stuff, I want to show people like what the reality is of it, right? The there proof were so the many pudding. people. Yeah. Exactly. There was a lot of people teaching stuff that was either regurgitated from others or <clears throat> just had no proof behind it. So I was like, well, I have had a successful business online. Let me share it with people fully. Today I'm joined by an old school podcaster, really one of the, the OG podcasters from the very beginning of podcasting. Um, to get an idea of just how long he's been doing this, this is my 13th episode, Lucky 13. Uh, his most recent podcast, as of this recording anyway, was episode 579. Yeah, that, that is uh, 45 times more episodes than I've done. <laughs> Though I think I've done more YouTube videos than him, so I've got that going for me. But the guy I'm talking about here is Pat Flynn from the Smart Passive Income podcast, where he teaches people how to start their own businesses online and be successful without just throwing away their lives in the process. So when I started this podcast, um, I was putting together a list of potential people that I would want to have on here. And I had several different buckets of people that I was uh, putting together. And one of those buckets was uh, content creators, um, content creators who inspired me back in the day. Not just because I think they're inspiring people with a good message, but frankly, because, you know, I always wanted to meet them, <laughs> you know, long before I was a person with a YouTube channel myself, um, I was just like everyone else. You know, I watched other people do this and I, I wanted to meet them. And now that I'm here, I will absolutely abuse the privilege that comes with being here and take the opportunity to do so shamelessly. I apologize for nothing. And Pat Flynn might have been one of the, the top three people on this list of content creators I was talking about because listening to his show and, and learning from him uh, really was one of the things that set me in the direction uh, to get me where I am now. Uh, but all this we get into in the podcast, I'll let you listen to it there. But but seriously, if you're if you're thinking of starting an online business or if it's something you've been working on or uh, you've started and you feel stuck, I cannot recommend his podcast enough. It's, it's definitely a must listen. But anyway, enough plugging the guest. I just want to thank Pat for taking the time to meet with me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. But for you guys, I'll stop talking and jump into my conversation with Pat Flynn. Um, I guess we should start by giving a shout out to our mutual friend who set this whole thing up. Yes, that's ben right. Ben Sullins. Mr. Ben. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate the connection. The one and only Ben Sullins. How do you know Ben? Uh, so Ben and I, we worked out of the same WeWork for a while in San Diego. Oh, okay. And yeah. I also got involved with Tesla. I'm a Tesla owner and he had Teslanomics back mm -hmm. in the day uh, before he switched over to more general EV type stuff for his content. and. Just really connected with him and, and who he is as a creator and a human being. He's just a good guy. And we actually had coffee two weeks ago. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of us here in San Diego. He and I still live in the same general area, and, and we try to hang out. Yeah. Well, I knew y'all were both in San Diego, but I don't assume that everybody knows each other in in the cities. Like, I'm in Dallas, and everybody's like, well, my roommate's cousin's college friend <laughs> lives there. You know him? And it's like, well, yeah, of course I know him. It's, it's... That's true. Although that being said, the creator space and the entrepreneurial space is pretty small. So, I mean, mm. a lot of us do know each other in the same spaces that we live in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it was a real like small world kind of situation for me because uh, Ben and I have been doing a podcast for a couple of years now and we you know knew each other for a while before that. And he mentioned that he knew you and I was like, oh, my God, I've been listening to him for years. That's I've been crazy. listening to your podcast since like maybe 2010 or something like that. I mean, when did you when did you even start it? 2010. Exactly. Really? <laughs> so literally right from the beginning. And, you know, I was at a conference and uh, I remember telling people when I started the podcast and like, wow, you've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, and I have. And it's really cool to hear people who have been in it or listening mm -hmm. since since early on. I appreciate that, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I guess for our listeners, uh, why don't I let you go ahead and just say what you do and, and talk about your podcast for a second, just yeah, in case yeah, somehow sure. they haven't heard of you. Oh, no, I'm sure many haven't. Uh, <laughs> So I do a lot of things, actually. The The quick story is I had gotten laid off from my architecture job in 08 during the Great Recession. I built an online business helping people pass an architectural exam, which took off like crazy. And then I had a lot of people ask me, how did you do that? So I decided mm -hmm. to start a website and a podcast and a YouTube channel to sort of show the ropes, um, but never approaching it like you should do this. It was just, 
here's how I built the architecture thing and here's what worked and here's what I wish I'd done differently and kind of just always took that transparent approach. And in fact, I was also sharing how many customers we were getting, how much I was making, how much I was spending and all, all, all the things. And mm -hmm. apparently in the internet marketing space at the time, it was kind of full of more snake oil salesmen. So I kind of stood out really quickly uh, in the internet marketing space at the time and I just started to really, really dive into this world and try to help people. And mm -hmm. uh, since then I've created several books, podcasts, YouTube channels and, and whatnot. I even have uh, dove into a lot of other uh, niches as a result of just experimentation, always mm -hmm. trying new things and then just sharing with people, here's how it went. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't. And I have a software company at fusebox.fm, which helps podcasters. I have an invention called the Switch Pod, which is a tripod for traveling and on the go yeah, filming. Yeah. Um, I recently started a Pokemon hobby based YouTube channel, which just crossed 200,000 subs not too long ago. Uh, and then my main gig uh, where I started helping people with business is called SPI or Smart Passive Income. And it involves a team of 10 people with a community and uh, just a ton of content to help people get started in, in, in whatever way they can yeah. uh, in whatever way they want. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now, but I just am really excited to, to, to have been seen as somebody who is sort of, you know, what was on the cutting edge of, of entrepreneurship uh, kind of in the early days when it was just blogging. I was yeah. definitely one of the OG podcasters <laughs> and I still do that. And I still teach people podcasting. It's my favorite platform. And here we are on a podcast together now. Woo. <laughs> How often do you do other people's podcasts? Um, I try to get at least two or three interviews a week in. Um, oh, I wow, get okay. asked probably to do 50 interviews a, a, a week um, wow. on other shows, but it's just, I don't have that time. Sure. And, and, and I have just a, a finite av amount of energy to devote to, the businesses and especially my family so it's mostly saying no at this point and mm -hmm. definitely didn't start out that way but I'm, I'm grateful to be in that position well, i'm grateful that i'm one of the people you said yes to wow <laughs> well you can <laughs> feel, thank ben feel for that. special now <laughs> yeah see it's, it's it is the context it's the people you know it's the friends you made along the way right is that it really it is? is it really is something that you used to do that kind of blew my mind back then and now that um and i don't know how much you might know about me but i've got a youtube channel that's at about 1.4 million right now and so it's kind of become a whole thing so I have a bit of exposure and all that, you know, um, but you would actually like release your, I don't know if you still do this or not, but you would release your financial statements. Like you would show people exactly like how much money you were making and stuff. I did. I did that first in October of 2008 because I wanted to show people, hey, here's my yeah. architecture business. Here's how many of this product that I made we sold. Here's how much we're making from advertising. You can do it too. Look, I did it. I'm, I'm just a regular guy who figured it out and now I want you to try this on your own if you want to try it too. Uh, and I did that because I, for two reasons. Number one, I was like, if I'm going to teach this stuff, I want to show people like what the reality is of it, right? The there were so the many pudding. people. Yeah. Exactly. There was a lot of people teaching stuff that was either regurgitated from others or <clears throat> just had no proof behind it. So I was like, well, I have had a successful business online. Let me share it with people fully. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, there was a personal finance blog that I used to follow. It wasn't very well known, but I loved it because this guy shared exactly the mutual funds and investments that he was putting his money into. And mm -hmm. it was like, I could follow his advice more fully because he was actually putting his money where his mouth was. Uh, uh, and so that was mymoneyblog.com. Mm -hmm. And I got inspired just to be fully transparent in the same way. And plus like, you know, if you're investing in the stock market with companies, they have their earnings reports, they share the numbers because we wanna know whether or not we should continue to invest or the health of the company. So I was like, I'm just gonna do this in, mm -hmm. you know, a bullet, point list post once per month uh and it was supposed to be just actually one month and so many people loved it that i just kept going with it and i went with it for 10 years straight uh -huh. and in october of 2018 i decided to stop it and the reason was because we were at a point now in the business where we were generating over six figures a month and people were seeing those numbers and going this is way beyond my level. Like you're you're oh, beyond it me. was almost intimidating to people it was too intimidating wow. exactly okay. so my goal is to help inspire and serve those beginner entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And that was doing exactly the opposite. It was actually making them feel like it was out of reach or that they were too late or, or that any of that stuff. So I stopped it and focused on, well, just here, let me help you with your first steps. Let me help you build your email list to 100. And we created a challenge for that and all those mm -hmm. kinds of things versus uh, what some people read as, you know, some people mis, uh, you know, misread those income reports is like, look at, like Pat saying, look at me and how much money I'm making, which of it course. never was yeah. that. Yeah. But when you get to that level, it's like, why are you even sharing this? It's not inspiring. 
you're just doing this to show off. And I was like, I read that and I'm going to respond mm. to it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I just remember you would do that. And I was like, God, the balls on this guy to just like, just to share that so transparently. And then when I started doing YouTube, um, it became clear really early on that like that kind, maybe not that level of transparency, but just like really sharing yourself with people and you're being transparent with people, you know, people connect with that. Oh, yeah. Um, and what's funny is, I don't know if funny is the right word, but like I've actually gotten away from that quite a bit in the last couple of years, just because as the exposure has grown, um, there's, you know, there's some people that aren't quite all there and, and oh, it's, yeah. it got kind of scary for a little bit there. So I've backed off quite a bit on, on sharing that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a line and, and, and yeah. we have to realize that the bigger our audiences get, the more crazy people there are that we're attracting as well. I mean, I wrote about this in my book, Super Fans, which was about building fans, but there's a mm -hmm. whole chapter about dark side of that. Uh, and so you do got to protect yourself. You do got to do what's right for you and your family. But at the same time, I think that people do appreciate openness. People do appreciate transparency. Mm -hmm. And you can move that level wherever you feel comfortable, right? Don't just share your income because Pat's doing it, right? And, and you know, I know a, a friend of mine, his name's Chris. He... Uh, is known as a virtual CEO, and he wants to build teams so that he can take as much time away from the business, have it continue to run, and he can have more time to do other things. So instead of an income report, he did a uh, work hours report. So every week he would report how many hours he actually worked this week and then how the business had done, not financially, but just the fact that he was slowly removing himself from the business by making these hirings. Mm -hmm. And that was inspiring, right? Because it went with his brand of virtual CEO and hiring out and building a team. So now he's at a point where he's like four hours a week, like literally four hour work week, which, you know, was seemingly impossible. But now with teams and automation and systems, you know, it can be done and, and that's inspiring. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I got really into that for a while, the whole Tim Ferriss thing. Mm -hmm. um, did you do a low carb diet, the slow carb the diet? Slow, I did do the slow carb diet. You did do so, yeah. Lots no. of lentils. Oh gosh, I hate you. I hate. <laughs> <laughs> I used to make this. I, I would just call it mush, and it was like, it was lentils and chicken, and I want to say like peas and carrots and you know some some veggies in there and stuff, and I would just like make a whole week's worth of it and just just eat it. It was like gruel, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Luckily, I'm the kind of person that can just eat the same thing every day and it doesn't bother me that much. But um, yeah. yeah, I don't do that now. <laughs> I do way too much Uber Eats, actually. It's kind of embarrassing. Oh, yeah. But... DoorDash over here. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, but yeah, no, I was, I was, I failed miserably. Actually, this was one thing I, I didn't want to jump into it so early, but since we're there, uh, I wanted to talk about the whole work life balance kind of thing. Yeah. Because um, for, for a while there, it was very much hustle culture and it was, uh, uh um oh, what's his name hello Vaynerchuk Gar Gary V yeah yeah it was Gary V and Seth Godin and those types that was just like you just gotta crank just gotta crank do the grind you know and and a lot of people were inspired by that I was inspired by that but I feel like there's been a shift away from that in in more recent years where it's kind of like you know we, we need our lives back a little bit yeah um anti-hustle actually anti-hustle is what it's called uh, I mean, that's there. There's that's like a a, a definition of like anti-hustle culture. It's like we are so tired and overworked yeah. now. Like you said, we need to get our life back and uh -huh. like sc screw that. So that's like the new movement is anti-hustle culture. Yeah, whatever, which is interesting. Yeah. That is interesting, and I've failed miserably at that. Uh, <laughs> my thing is, um, I'm really. It sounds pretentious to even say this, but I'm really more of an artist than a business person. Like, I just love to write and I love to create. Um, mm -hmm. That's what led me to doing YouTube. I actually have a side business that was uh, partially inspired by people like you that um, I sell a vitamin supplement for a, a very specific uh, medical condition. It's for canker sores. Um, I'll, I'll tell that story just real quick. I, I uh, is, This is a problem that I've had and other people in my family have had. I've had it my whole life. It's not, it's not herpes, it's not cold sores, it's the, the canker sores on the inside. And you go to the d dentist or the doctor and they're just like, yeah, some people get them, man. I don't know. And I'm like, dude, I yeah. can't eat. <laughs> you know, right, Give me right. something. Um, so I just started experimenting and researching and I found a combination of vitamins that helped me out and it didn't exist as a single pill anywhere. So I was like, okay, you know, um, I got a little bit, 
I shouldn't say the word lucky, but I had a um, a little bit of inheritance that came down to me, um, just enough to kind of get my first batch manufactured, and and now it's a company called Canker Boy. But um, that was supposed nice. to be the thing that paid for the creative stuff, and Canker Boy's still there, and it's it's you know making a profit and everything, but it's never really exploded or anything like that. Whereas YouTube did yeah. <laughs> for me. Um, so the thing that I love putting the time and the effort into is the thing that's now like paying all the bills and stuff. Um, and it's really, really, really hard for me to not just constantly be working. Um, yeah. I, I, the balance I guess, is hard. I guess the workaholic brand is applied to me now. Cause like, I'll just sit and watch a movie now and it's just, I, I just almost get twitchy. Like I can't, I can't get away. It's from hard it to turn it off, long. man. It's yeah. very hard for people like us to turn it off. And it, either will lead you to a point in your life where there's something dramatic that happens to reset you, mm -hmm. right? It's similar to like my dad, he was eating poorly, suffered a heart attack, now he's eating better, right? <laughs> and we don't wanna yeah. get to that point where we have our version of a heart attack, but for many entrepreneurs, that's what it takes, right? And for me, I didn't have a, something super severe like that, but I remember even before I had kids, uh, my wife and I were having a conversation and you know, like her mouth was moving and she was making noises, but I was not listening. Mm -hmm. I was in my head thinking about the next product launch or the email that I had to write or all that, the next video I was gonna make or whatever. And she caught me like literally mid thought. She knew that I wasn't listening. She's like, you're not listening to me right now, are you? And in a very stern voice, right? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I am. And she was like, well, what did I just say? And I said, oh crap, uh, wah, you're not wah, listening to me, wah, are wah, you? Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I, the bed, was just occupied by her that night and i had uh <laughs> we, we we had some really deep conversations about that right yeah. rightfully so and thankfully so because we were about to have kids and i don't want to be that parent who is with my kids physically but also not with them mentally mm -hmm. and so i'm very grateful that she called me out on that and so we were able to create boundaries and so i was able to train myself in a way to have two different kinds of boundaries to help myself out of that number one a time-based boundary. So even though I broke away from the nine to five, thankfully, I still needed a schedule to mm. mentally check in and mentally check out of. And so that was really key. And number two, it is a physical space to walk into to do work and to walk out of to do work. Okay. And to almost not even allow myself to be able to do work if I'm not in that space. Now that's become a little bit harder because we have phones and we can do all the things there too but I've done a very good job of disciplining myself because I know that if I were to fall into that trap, it's actually time taken away from my kids, time taken away from my wife, or if I'm just by myself watching a movie, it's time taken away from myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all deserve to have some meditation time, peace time, our time, um, because if you just keep cranking on the business stuff, I mean, it's eventually going to wear you out. Like I've seen several of my friends end up mm -hmm. and that's not good. Yeah. So, so the scheduling of it, is it, is it, uh, I'd like to dive a little deeper into that. Like, do you, yeah. do you schedule out an eight hour day just like if you were going into an office or is it like work for a couple hours and then schedule in a midday break or whatever? Like, do you have something it's, like that? It takes some time. So for what, what works for me may not work for yeah. you. It's like a diet, right? We got to figure out who we are and what, what works best for us. Um, for me now, I mean, it did start, okay, I'm just going to go back to nine to five and work nine to five. And I determined really quickly that that was not going to work. I needed breaks. So I started to put mm -hmm. breaks in there, but then I realized that I needed some more guidance, some more discipline on what I was doing each day, even leading into it. So now what happens is my days are scheduled as follows. Monday is writing day. Tuesday is podcast day. Wednesday is meetings day. Thursday and Friday are, are cleanup days, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to go into one of those days knowing that, okay, this is my podcasting day. I can be mentally ready for it. I can make sure to schedule things just on that day. It doesn't always work out because other people have schedules too, but I try to say, you know, hey, my podcasting day is on Tuesday. Do you have anything on Tuesday? And in most cases it works out. Uh, and and that, that helps me with productivity because I can batch process those things on that day versus bouncing around from one thing to another. I found that when I bounce around from one thing to another, I lose a little bit of momentum between each. And so mm. there's that sort of transition cost that comes with that uh, versus I can be in the flow state more easily if I'm just cranking on writing on Monday, for example. Uh, and then, you know, we are designing the business in this way too. We uh, have 10 people working full-time in my SPI media company. We have a four-day work week. 
And so Friday is off and that allows me to go fishing or to have something scheduled that is literally outside of business in many cases outside of even connectivity so that I can recharge and have that time for myself. And yeah, lately it's been bass fishing. <laughs> Where do you do that? Uh, there's plenty of lakes in San Diego to be able to oh, do okay. that for yeah. sure. Uh, I'm very close to buying a kayak for my 40th birthday. And then I might start competing in tournaments and such because kayak fishing is taking off right now. It's 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 really fun. That's the new thing. That's the new hotness. Yeah, especially because gas prices and boats need gas, and you know people oh, want to be out in yeah, the water yeah. still, kind of thing. Yeah. So I guess you'd have to like pack your your rods and and gear and stuff. Into oh yeah, if you look up bass fishing kayak, it looks like a mini battleship. <laughs> It's awesome with poles yeah. sticking up and there's rod holders and there's a little trolling motor and there's just all these things. What's really cool about these tournaments is like they also are better for fish because with bass boats, you put them in a live well, right? And then you weigh them and you do all the things and then you like dump them all in one area and they're like, hey, I was far removed from my home. Where do I go? Uh, Versus this one, it's a, it's called CPR, catch photo release. You take a photo yeah, yeah. of it with a measuring thing. And it dynamically gets uploaded and the leaderboards for these tournaments get changed like dynamically. And then you put the fish back. It's like really cool. So you can know that you need like a couple more inches on the next fish right before the tournament ends or something. It's, it's just really fun. Anyway, sorry. Tangent. No, I love that. Actually, that's one of my favorite things when I talk to people like you is to get you to talk about something that you don't normally get to talk about, but you're really passionate about. I think this is the first. I know nothing about bass fishing. fishing. Online, so. I know nothing about it, but I would love to hear you go in deeper <laughs> on it. Like how, how do you, how do you, how do you get bigger fish? Like, it feels like a very luck of the draw kind of thing to me. Uh, it is and it isn't. I mean, it depends on the season, pre-spawn, spawn, post-spawn. There's different areas of cover where bigger fish tend to lie. There's male versus female and the different behaviors of each. There's the temperature. There's, the, there's like a million factors. It's And I'm still learning about this myself, but you could have the biggest bait and catch the smallest fish, and you can have the smallest bait and catch the biggest fish. So that's part of the fun, too. You never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and and I, I am a little bit competitive, so to add a little tournament aspect on top of that is, uh -huh. is going to be fun too. But I'm not going to create a YouTube channel about it. <laughs> oh, you should start now, doing though. the um, – what is it? The with the cat that catch the catfish the with their hands? Oh, yeah. The, I, I would – the catfish would eat me most likely. Yeah, I'm having um, a brain fart on what that's called. Yeah, Somebody's I've seen that screaming on, on at their radio channel. right now. <laughs> um, but no, everything that you just mentioned about finding the bigger fish that that would apply to everybody on the lake that day, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Although there is there is even like there's this thing called live scope, where literally it's like a screen in front of you, uh -huh. and it sends certain sonar signals out, and you get these like patterns back, but it's in real time, and it's not just like what's below you; it's what in front, what's in front of you. So you can mm. literally see fish moving in front of you. You cast your bait out, and on the screen you see your bait. Oh wow! So they call it. They call it video game fishing because it's kind of yeah. like that. And there's this debate in the community right now. It's like, is that cheating? Because it's almost like too easy, but that technology is available now. And you also use sonar and you've used it for years. This is just an upgraded version of that. Yeah. Anyway, there's it's it's kind of fun. <laughs> I can tell you, like, I need I need to stop talking about this. <laughs> no, I, I like now I'm like, maybe I should start a podcast or something about bass fishing. You're clearly talk, into it. That's I fun. feel like I could talk about this a lot now. Anyway, I, go well, ahead, just uh, I, again, to me. Growing up in Texas, you would think I have a little bit more experience with fishing, but I really don't. I've, I've been a few times, but not that much. Um, but for me, the, the fishing tournaments, I always thought the fact that they they measured it by size, again, it just feels like luck of the draw to me. And unless, unless there's some way of catching a bigger fish or some technique behind it, like... I mean, the the best way to catch the bigger fish is just catch more fish, right? So right. there is some skill with, with regards to that. What Joe, what is your version of my fishing? <laughs> what is it that I'm into like that? Yeah. God, that's a good question. Um, this is what happens when you interview a podcaster who's uh -huh. used to interviewing others, so I'm going to flip it around. you got to turn it back around on me. <laughs> Damn it. Um, I guess it would have been movies once upon a time. It would have been tennis once upon a time. Although I don't... Tennis, nice. Yeah, I was, I was like really big into tennis. I need to get back into it. The problem is I'm so pale <laughs> that like being outside for two hours now is just like... Okay, so pickleball maybe, like or something yeah. <laughs> like indoors. <laughs> maybe, yeah, or racquetball. Um, you know what? That's th this is one of the things that this is one of my problems. I'm actually seeing a therapist about this right now. I don't have any like big hobbies like that. I don't have anything that I'm like really I get a charge off of outside of my my work. This is going huh. back to our our discussion a second ago. So what's the end game? Exactly. 
Interesting. I need help, Pat. <laughs> well, let's chat. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I didn't find, I didn't, I wasn't like, I need something, let me go get fishing. It's like, I just try a bunch of things Damn. and see what lights me up, right? And sometimes those things work, sometimes they don't. And it's just like, so so in in, in my schedule, to, keep, to go back to the schedule, mm-hmm. I practice what I like to call the 20% itch rule. And what that is, it's very similar to like how Google allows 20% of their employees time right. to just build new things or experiment. I have Monday to Thursday to do business specific things. And I know that my time dedicated to that will get all the things that I need done. But that's 80% of my time. Friday, I use for play. And mm-hmm. play can be business, play can be not business, but I experiment with that. In 2017, the 20% of time that I was using to scratch that itch was to build a switch pod, an invention. Mm-hmm. I never invented something. I'm not in e-commerce, but I wanted to explore and visit that. And if it failed, that's okay because I still have the 80% of stuff going on. Uh, recently it's been the Pokemon YouTube channel and now it's like the fishing stuff and I go fishing on Fridays. So the cool thing about that is, you know, have you, have you ever heard of the book, the one thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan? There's this book. It's like focus on one thing. Cause if you do the one thing, it like all your energy goes there and whatever you're working on has more of a chance of succeeding, which I get, I can't do just one thing mm-hmm. though. Yeah. I have to do more, but if I let myself go crazy, I'll do a hundred things and none of those things will do anything for me. But if I can reserve, again, a boundary or a space of time to do the one other thing that is just whatever is of interest to me right now, then I get that fulfillment without the worry of, you know, sabotaging the other things. Mm-hmm. This episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream. Okay, so you know how uh, sponsor reads like this? They always heap tons of praise on the sponsor and tell you how amazing they are and, oh, it's the best thing you're ever going to get. Well, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to tell you what I don't like about Curiosity Stream. When I'm writing these ad reads, you know, I try to find a specific video to recommend just to give you a good taste of what's on there. And I, I usually try to, you know, find a show that adds to whatever the video or the podcast was about. So you can go deeper on that subject if you want to. You know the drill. You've, you've seen this before. Well, every time I do this, I go to Curiosity Stream and I just scroll down the list of thousands of documentary films, each of them more interesting than the last. And maybe I pick one and I think, well, let me just take a minute and just look at this real quick. And then 30 minutes go by and I forget what I was doing. So I click back and I find another one and the process repeats itself until two in the morning. There's that much great stuff on Curiosity Stream. Documentaries on science, history, art, the list keeps going from some of the best filmmakers around the world. And while some other streaming services that shall go unnamed keep raising their prices, Curiosity Stream is insanely affordable at only $14.79 for the entire year when you use my URL, curiositystream.com slash Pod. But it gets even better because when you signed up for Curiosity Stream, you get Nebula, the streaming service that I'm a part of, along with many of your other favorite smart YouTubers, where you can see our stuff ad-free and earlier than everyone else, meaning this podcast on Nebula wouldn't have this amazing ad read that you're listening to right now. It's also the only place where you can see my Nebula original series, Mysteries of the Human Body, and my brand new series called Forgotten Atrocities, where I take a look at some of the darker moments in human history that you might not have ever heard of. And yeah, you get both of those services for only $14.79, for an entire year. Now, I know the economy kind of looks scary these days. You might be tightening the belt when it comes to subscription services, but I did the math. It comes out to 62 cents per month per service. It's practically impossible to get more bang for your buck. So again, to get all that, just go to curiositystream.com slash Pod. Again, that's curiositystream.com slash Pod, and you can get as lost in their library as I do every week. So go check it out, and thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this podcast. Now back to Pat. For me, I guess it would be something, it's, and it is a little bit still too close to my, my job job, but um, but one of the things I enjoy about doing the channel that I do and, and the YouTubing is that I'm, I'm always finding some new subject, a new rabbit hole to go down, you know, mm-hmm. and um, I guess you could call that sort of like my hobby or whatever, but but like it's, it's kind of the same thing. Like I'm always finding some new thing that I'd never really thought about before. Like I did a video this week on the spice trade. Uh, from back in the history and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of blew my mind. The more I looked into it, it was like, wow, this kind of explains the entire world the way it is right now, you know? And and just so many dots got connected and just kind of like going through that process for me is like, it's a a fun little charge. Um, Now my background before I started doing YouTube was filmmaking. 
mm-hmm. and um, screenwriting and stuff. And I'm I'm getting more into that. I've got a few scripts floating around out there. I'm working on some pitch decks for them. So I like it. I yeah, like that. hopefully something turns out. Um, there's some there's some good things happening. Um, That's cool. But again, it's I wouldn't call that like the the thing I do to go and decompress. You know, it's 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 definitely an escape from reality. <laughs> what, if, what what if you do position it that way? I mean, it kind of is. So, like, I I gotten away from screenwriting for so long because I was all YouTube all the time. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I started doing a couple years ago uh, a live uh, live stream reading of a script on mm-hmm. Halloween. So I had a, a a ghost story script, and it was Halloween, and I was like, "Why don't I just do a get some people together and we'll just do a reading of it?" You know, and it you know people seem to enjoy it, and I enjoyed it. Um, so we did it again last year with a with a kind of an alien script. Um, yeah, that's cool. but I hadn't been doing the screenwriting stuff in so long that I would go to the coffee shop, kind of getting it, you know, kind of polishing it up a little bit before the big day, you know, cause I hadn't looked mm-hmm. at the screenplay in a while. And I noticed as I was driving home, I was just in the best mood. And, and I was kind of like, I really love this stuff. I forgot how much I love like getting into characters and, and dialogue and, and people's yeah, yeah. motivations and stuff. And, um, it is an escape from reality. You're like creating a new one and, and, and you're creating people. And, and sometimes you even get emotional about it because they, they say that uh, the key to good storytelling is create a character that everybody falls in love with and then put them through hell. You yeah. know? <laughs> right, uh, right. And, and sometimes I'll fall in love with a character and then I have to like make them do this thing or, or kill them or something. And it's just like, oh, it's just, it's heartbreaking, you know? Yeah, it's, you, it's a you'd weird be a thing. a writer for uh, The Walking Dead, that's for sure. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. that's what, like, what if that, like, what if you were just like, that is my thing and I'm going to make sure mm-hmm. I make time for it. Cause it does fulfill me with no other reason than to just have fun with it. And if you happen to use it also for the YouTube channel, cool. If not mm-hmm. cool, like that's awesome. I'm and getting I back think that into escape that. is really yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's something that I've actually said. It, I, I love giving advice that I don't actually take. Um, <laughs> but it was like, look at what you did when you were a kid just mm-hmm. for fun, just because it made you happy, you know? Fishing. And Fishing. Well, I mean, for me, it was tennis, you know, uh, but things that you did when there wasn't a profit motive and it wasn't something that paid your bills, you know, what, what was it that just gave you joy and reconnect with that? That's, that's what I keep trying to think about is like ways that I could, I could do that. Yeah. Does it spark joy? Isn't and there's that organization book, right? Marie that Kondo. Has you, yeah, yeah. It has yeah. you question like literally every item that you have in your house and you're like, does this spark joy? Yes. No. If not move it away. Yeah. Why don't we do that with our mental cabinets? Right. And the things that we do. Um, I like that framing. Find, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. It's funny how it can quickly become a therapy session, though, if you've been disconnected from that for so long. Oh, yeah. Where like, I, I mean, talk about oversharing. No, I, I, I was in uh, seeing a therapist once upon a time. And, and uh, first thing she asked me was, what makes you happy? And I just kind of sat there and was like, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. And then, and then I was like heartbroken for myself is like, Oh my God, what happened to me? I don't even know what makes me happy. It's, it's a weird thing to get disconnected from, but I think it happens really quickly and really easily. I think, I think you're right. I mean, we, especially in this space where things happen really fast and there's always the next thing to do. We don't have time Mm -hmm. to just like stop and think about, you know, what would be best for us. And, and especially when you combine that and just how fast things are with people who are so giving and so wanting to help others, it's like, well, eventually it gets to a point where you break down and you can't help others, right? It's why when you get on the plane, they say, put the mask on yourself yeah, first before yeah. you put on others. And and we always forget to do, I forget to do that. And and I think, you know, it's important that we, um, we take care of ourselves so we can take care of others. Mm-hmm. I want to say real quick, just since we're kind of dipping into that, um, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to say this. One thing that I love about you and your message and what you've always done on your podcast and stuff is it, is it does seem to be always in service of other people. Like that is front and center always Thank with you. what you talk about. And um, I think that's so powerful because, because you do talk about like ways to make all this money and there is a lot of money involved and stuff. And there's all these like sort of marketing techniques and that can get, well, it can get overwhelming for one thing, but it can also get kind of gross, you know, if you yep. if you frame oh, yeah. it in that way. But but you have always been about like create something that will help people, 
and and then give them information around that and you know and then you can use the giving of that information to build a sales funnel and you know an email list and all that kind of stuff but but it was kind of like start there mm -hmm. um and i just wanted to say i always I always thought that was just a great message and and you were able to you were able to kind of do the hustle culture thing if you don't mind me you know using that term or whatever but like um do it in a way that is of benefit to other people not just yourself you know i think if you, and i would love to give you a chance to talk about that no thank you i first of all i appreciate that a lot um <laughs> what's a little scary about that comment is like is, <laughs> like is is that is that that unique that it gets pointed oh. out because everybody else is doing it for themselves and the answer is probably yeah in many cases that's probably true um so it was favorable when i first started out first of all with the how to do business stuff that i already had a proven business right many people were mm. uh, regurgitating other people's information and pretending that they knew what they were doing when they didn't have any proof for themselves uh but secondly like i think it definitely helped that i wasn't even trying to generate an income from the how to do, do business stuff because i already had the income coming in from the architecture stuff so mm. there was nothing hard pitch about anything I was doing. It was just, here's what I'm doing. And if you want to do something similar, here are the tools that I use. And people would click on those tools and it was an affiliate link and you know that kind of thing. It's like the difference between somebody standing up at a podium and saying, do this, you need this, go do this versus me just like on the ground with people being like, well, here's what I did and this worked, this didn't work. If you want to do it too, well, like here are the steps <laughs> so that you don't have to figure it out yourself. Yeah. And that and that's the approach I took, and so it became very clear very quickly that the more that I poured into helping people figure things out and remove the confusion, the more people were just like, "Oh, how can I pay you back for that? Like, oh, yeah. you've helped me so much. Can I like people like one guy sent me literally his credit card number and was just like, "Can you charge a hundred or like a hundred bucks to this card because I feel like I owe you for all that you've given." Wow. And I was like, first of all. Don't ever email Don't anybody ever do your credit that. card. <laughs> you idiot! Yeah, uh, but I was also very grateful, and I was yeah. like, I was like, I don't need anything from you. But then he insisted, and then I gave him my PayPal, and I was just like, like the law of reciprocity really mm -hmm. plays a role here. Mm -hmm. And so I just pour in as much as I can, and now I have other mechanisms, courses, and a community, a paid community, and such that people will invest in. But they invest in after knowing that a that they're gonna be paid attention to and that they they belong, uh, but they're also saving time and money by investing in what we've already gone through, right? It's almost like you're paying not for uh, the course content, you're paying for the decade long worth of experience that I've gone yeah. through so that you can just get the result quicker yourself um, and get it faster. So uh, thank you for saying that. And, and, and that's what I try to teach others, right? Serve first, help other people get what they want and it just is mind-boggling to me that like isn't that how all businesses should be <laughs> like why is this such a unique thing that stands out like that's that should be foundational yeah and yet it's not well i mean there's i'm sure there's other people and there, there's some that i'm thinking of but um you were one of them that really stood out for me anyway in the early days um but i wanted to like <clears throat> excuse me one thing that's always stuck out to me doing uh the youtube thing is is um uh, just kind of a mind blower for me is is how the ripples we create go out into the world and create more ripples and inspire other people to do things i've i've gotten emails and people sent me things that uh have brought me to tears that yeah, for whatever reason something that i've done or said like led them down a path that changed their lives or whatever and i don't even talk about like forgive the term but like self help kind of stuff like i don't even talk about like self improvement uh, or small business kind of stuff. It's just, I just talk about random facts that, you know, happen to touch people in some way, but, um, yeah. I can only imagine the kind of stuff that you get. And I wanted to see if there was anything that like really stood out to you, like a story of a person who reached out and said that like, so my podcast started in 2010, 2012 comes by and I'm seeing like plateaus, like in all the numbers Yeah. and my blog is taking off. The YouTube channel is doing really well, but the podcast is just kind of stagnant. So, you know, I consider dropping it. But right before I dropped it, I got an email from somebody in Poland. His name, his name was uh, Michal, M-I-C-H-A-L. And it was like pages long, this email. 
And thankfully, he had a good subject line that allowed me to want to read it, and that was, Pat, <laughs> you saved my life. Please read this. Oh. And I said, okay. So I read this story, and he said that he was uh, kind of an extreme sports guy, and he got a terrible injury, broke both his legs. He shared his uh, x-rays and, like, pins and needles, like, all inside, of the, like, keeping things holding on. But he fell into depression. He wasn't able to work anymore. His family had to take care of him. He had two young kids, and he was just down. And he said that he discovered my podcast while he was waiting in bed, uh, just kind of in recovery mode. Mm -hmm. And that even though I don't similarly don't talk about physical therapy or, you know, self-help in that kind of way, I was business. He said that I became his rehabilitation coach <laughs> and every day he had listened. And he said that he listened to an episode where I talk about goal setting. And when it comes to goal setting, I often recommend you go beyond what you think is easily possible so that you can continue to stretch yourself. And he said that. With two broken legs, he was going to run a marathon in two years um, or in a year and a half in Warsaw, Poland, 26.2 miles. With two broken legs, he said that. He said, every day, you listen to my podcast. And I'm like reading this. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this happened this whole time, and I didn't even know any of this. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the email, he shares a picture of him crossing the finish line on two legs, holding up a sign after 26.2 miles. And on the sign, it was in Polish, but he translated it. It said, thank you, God. Thank you to his kids. And thank you, Pat Flynn. Aww. And I was just like bawling yeah. dude like yeah. my keyboard was getting wet i was bawling so uh -huh. hard because i was just about to quit this and he said if it wasn't for your podcast i wouldn't have done this and what's crazy is since then we've become friends and he has been keeping me up to date with what he's doing he is now one of the top podcasters in poland he has created a uh, a wealth management um sort of uh financial company um, he has published, self-published a book uh, that had over 100,000 copies sold, and now his message is getting out there. And he shared with me a few years later a picture of another person crossing a marathon holding a sign with his name on it. Isn't that amazing? So ripple after ripple yeah. after ripple. And then I went to the UK to speak at an event uh, in 2019, and um, I didn't know, but he was in the audience. And at the end of my talk, he came up and gifted me that banner with Aww. my name on it and I, I have it up there but uh i almost gave up on the podcast mm -hmm. and i i vowed from that point forward to go i'm never giving up on this podcast because i have no idea who's listening to this who is utilizing or needs this or or, or could benefit from it he didn't have to send me that email but i'm grateful he did but how mm -hmm. many people are not going to send me that email mm -hmm. even though they're going through something similar so yeah. yeah here i am 12 years later funny how that came at just the right time for you <sighs> He works in mysterious he ways. He saved you too. Yes. He, he adopted me, as we say to our, our dogs or whatever. Um, <laughs> can I share a similar story? Please. Sorry? Yeah, I want to hear it. Um, I got an email. This was maybe six months, nine months ago, something like that. Um, and um, I don't remember what the subject line said, but when I opened it up, there was an image in the email, and it was of a calendar of the date that had just passed. Um, maybe a few days before or something like that. Mm. And um, <clears throat> so like on a computer and there was an event on the calendar that just said the last day. And I'm like, okay. And I start reading this guy's email. And what he said was that um, a year before he had been, I guess, suicidal and just a really bad place. And he basically said, I'm going to give myself a year to turn my life around uh, or else I'm just going to end it. So he went ahead and put in the calendar the last day Jeez. as the day he was going to end things. But um, he said somewhere along the way he, he found my channel. And for whatever reason, it sparked an interest in something. I did a video on something that sparked his interest or whatever. And he started looking further into it. He got more interested. He you know, went to classes for it, got a degree in it, got a job in it. Totally forgot that he had ever written that event down. And then, you know, the day came and it, he came across his calendar and he was like, oh, my God, I totally forgot about that. Mm. And he remembered that it was actually the video that I had done that had set him on that course. And he had reached out to tell me that. Wow. And you're right, bawling. I was just like, I'm done for the rest of the day. Yeah, right. <laughs> I can hardly even talk Gee about it now. Whiz. It's just like, and I don't even remember what the video was. I was probably talking out of my ass the whole time and I had no idea what I was talking about. But, you know. You never things know like who's that watching. that make, yeah you never know and and you never know what that person needs to hear even if you're not the right person to say it <laughs> you know incredible it is amazing
what we get to do. We're very lucky. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit. Let's let's just change the subject now. Um, yeah. <laughs> a little bit about like mentorship and um, finding you know coaches and stuff like that because I've heard you mention that a few times. Mm-hmm. It's something I've always struggled with is like finding a mentor. Like how exactly do you go about finding a mentor and how does that work? And do you have one and that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, this is uh this was a big topic when I was getting into entrepreneurship. People were like, you got to find a mentor uh, yeah. so that you could sort of follow their footsteps and guide you along the way. And I was like, I don't even know anybody. How am I going to like encourage somebody to want to help me out? And like, A, will they have the time? Like, is it going to be expensive? Like, would they even do it for free? I don't have any money, mm-hmm. et cetera. So I eventually learned that you could have what you might call a virtual mentor to start. And that might be a creator, a author, or a YouTuber, a podcaster, whoever, who seems to be living the kind of life where you want to go or is doing things that you eventually want to get to do too. And you follow their footsteps. You read their books. You consume their content. Okay. You so it's not, a, it's not a one-on-one. You're just kind of like reading what they, what they correct. create. And correct. Kind of, yeah, because okay. if, Using them if they are – Exactly. And if, if they're a good creator, they're likely – talking to their audience as if they're talking to somebody just like you. Yeah. And it seems one-to-one. They're guiding you sort of asynchronously, if you will. Um, over time, uh, I've sort of, you know, and I, and, and I, you know, initially it was people like Tim Ferriss and other people mm-hmm. who I read. Uh, the guys over at a podcast called Internet Business Mastery were like my legit virtual mentors. I listened to their podcast all the time. I felt like I knew them. I was listening to every single word. I invested in their program and that helped me out a lot. That doesn't exist anymore, but it was internet business mastery. And um, like, I just felt like they were people I could trust who were doing the things that I wanted to do. And, and they were immensely helpful and, and vital for my success. Uh, but over time, like I eventually got involved in communities where other people who were doing things similar to me existed. And some people are at higher levels, some people are at lower levels, et cetera. But it was really amazing because uh, some of those communities, I've been able to connect with a few individuals who then I connected with and turned into a mastermind group. And those mm-hmm. are groups that maybe it's not like a direct mentorship, but it almost feels like group mentorship from people who are at the same level or around the level that you're at. Yeah. Uh, and I prefer that over having like the the superstar multi-PhD person sort of like help you out with whatever it is you want to do. I mean, that kind of mentee mentorship relationship can be very powerful um but i found that with the groups i'm in that are now over a decade together we meet once a week it's sort of like a round table situation nobody's better than anybody else but we're all there to help each other and it's very formal in one week one person will be in a hot seat they'll come to the rest of the group with a challenge or something that's going on and the rest of the group will be there to not just support but also be brutally honest. Mm -hmm. And that honesty is very key because we often can't read the label when we're inside the bottle. So a lot of big, not just business, but specifically like life discoveries happen in those conversations because of people who are able to see uh, from the outside who actually care. And I care just the same about their stuff too. I mean, they're very high up in the sort of world of people who I care about, right? It's like, you know, God and family and and best friends and then my mastermind group. And then it's like... (laughs) you know, below that there's, there's others, but, uh, that, that can be a great source of outside help is, is, you know, colleagues. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I do have a coach, uh, his name is James Shramko from jamesshramko.com. And I follow him because he's been able to design his business in a way that has allowed him to, uh, almost surf every single day. So he's the Australian guy. It is the Australian guy. I was just listening to that podcast. a a little. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. James is great. And because he is at a point in life where I eventually want to go, he's, he's, he's removed himself as much as he can from his business, still continues to run it, but it's allowed him a lot more time to, you know, just, you know, be peace, uh, mm-hmm. like be at peace and be beyond that. And mostly just advise his company versus like be in the day to day anymore. And that's where I want to go with mine. Mm-hmm. Um, for a while in 2014 to 2018, my mentor was uh, Michael Hyatt. And he really helped me with learning how to build teams because that's something he did very well. And I saw that he went to, uh, he created a conference called the Platform Conference. And the whole time, this was his company putting on this conference, the whole time he was in the audience learning from the other speakers on the stage. And I was just like, how are you, this is your company, yet you're able to sit here? And he's like, I built a team for it Mm -hmm. so that I can do this and they can build that. And they are way better than I am at building this conference than I ever could. 
so that introduced me to the idea of letting go of some things that I was doing because I was doing everything mm -hmm. myself before from podcast editing to graphic design to the marketing and email writing, all the stuff I was doing. Now I'm at a point in the business where I can communicate with others in a situation like this on a podcast or I can create and I can be on, vi on video and the day-to-day, -day, all the other stuff is already taken care of. And it's just, that's exactly where I want to be mm -hmm. uh, for right now eventually get to the point where I'm removing myself even more. But uh, that's how I have, that's my experience with getting outside help, mentorship, and and coaching. Yeah, yeah. I actually have one of Michael Hyatt's books somewhere. That's why I was looking around when you mentioned this. Oh, name. nice. I forget where it is, but. Best year ever, perhaps, or? I think it was the uh, Your World Class forward. Assistant. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Uh, because I've been building a team around my channel, and I, I have an executive assistant now and everything, and I'm, I'm still the worst delegator in the world. I'm working on it. <laughs> It's skill that that's, it is a skill. It is absolutely, a skill, yeah. yeah. Um, what what would you attribute that skill to? Is it is it about trust and letting go, or being more clear in your communication? All of that. I mean, all of the above for sure. <laughs> um, that being said, I'm not the greatest at managing a team either, personally. Mm -hmm. Um, which is why I have an integrator in my business. This is a very common term: a online business manager or an integrator. Uh. It's actually the person who I brought in uh, initially to who is now CEO of my company, right? I actually removed myself from CEO and his okay. name is Matt Gartland. But there's a book out there called Rocket Fuel, which is really amazing. It, it, it talks about this dichotomy of the visionary type person and the integrator type person. You kind of need both. It's very rare to find somebody who is both a visionary and an integrator because they have different kinds of ways that their brains work. But if you are a visionary, which it sounds like you are, you might want to find somebody like an integrator who is very much in the weeds of the things of how they get how they work and into the spreadsheets and all that stuff. So the way it works is like I will come up with a project idea or an idea for some initiative in the business, and then the integrator or Matt uh, will go, okay, like I hear that you want to do that. Let me let me crank the numbers and see like what it would take to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And he'll come back to me and say take this much money or this much of the team's time or we will need a hire for this or yeah we could totally do that and we can do that if, if you give us the green light uh we have the capability to do it with what we have now yes or no and so that's kind of how it works that way when it gets built also i'm not even building it i'm not even in charge of that i just can stay high higher level mm -hmm. but that book rocket fuel has been a game changer and uh there are many integrators and online business managers that are out there and they're worth their weight in gold cool yeah, I'll check out that book. I hadn't seen that one before. Um, I wanted to step back just a little bit because like what we're talking about is pretty pretty high level stuff. It took me 10 years to get to this point to where I have yeah. a team around me and stuff. Um, but I'm sure you had talked about this. I, um, maybe that Tim Ferriss had too, but, or lots of people have, but, but getting a VA, like a virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. And there's you know people around the world that from places where they can work for pretty cheap and, and do Very. you know little little... I say little things, but it's not little things. It's 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 quite a bit. They can take on quite a bit of, of weight off your shoulders. Um, I did that when I was still working in my full time job. Uh, mm -hmm. I could barely afford it, <laughs> and um, I was working a full time job. I was running Canker Boy, and I had started doing the YouTube thing pretty regularly, maybe maybe weekly at that point. So mm -hmm. I was a busy dude, um, and I had just enough coming in from those side hustles that I could throw a little bit of money at a, at a VA in, over in the Philippines. And just that alone, I think that might've been some of the best advice that I've ever gotten or ever, ever used and executed on was, was like, just you're literally doubling your productivity by finding somebody else that can just do all the little grunt work that just takes up all your time and, and eats a lot oh, yeah. of your, your day. Um, so I, I was just putting myself in the position as you were talking of like somebody who's just, just trying to get started. And it's like, there's no way I can do that. If you can find a way to just find a little bit of extra income and throw that at a VA, um, and you might know better than I do. I'm sure you do the, the, the places you can go to find, uh, that kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to talk about that, but, but like that was, it was just a tiny little step. But it was it was so extremely helpful, and it also like got me toward toward the the mindset of like building a team and finding people to take the weight off you. Like you don't have to do everything yourself; you can find other people to, right. to be a part of it. So important, and you don't need a team of ten or twenty or a hundred. One other person to help support you and take a lot of those things off your plate 
is revolutionary, mm-hmm. honestly. Mm-hmm. Because those little things take up a ton of time when you add them all together and all the transition time between that and the other things that you want to do and should do. The trick is, what do we hand off? And realizing that, well, you don't have to hand off everything. What are the higher or bigger levers, if you will, that you are um, able to sort of let go of? And then experimenting with it, trying it out. Letting go is very difficult. I It took me years mm-hmm. to hand off podcast editing because I was actually great at it and I loved it. Mm-hmm. But is that what I should be doing yeah. if I'm going to try to grow or try to create more or try to build more relationships? Because that was taking five hours a week for me. But I was able to buy that time back essentially. Mm-hmm. And a person obviously came on and helped me. And guess what? They did it better and faster than I could. So there's that. Um, but even starting small, and yes, in the Philippines, there's a couple places you can go. Uh, the one that I highly recommend is uh, virtualstafffinder.com. That's run by my good friend, Chris Ducker. I think that's and what I actually it, used, yeah. Oh, good. It's like a headhunter service for, for these yeah. kinds of people. Um, why the Philippines? Because number one, it's very economical. Uh, number two, it's just the culture of Filipino people. I'm half Filipino myself. Very, very good English. Very, very loyal people. And... Um, You know, I found that that was uh, both a blessing and a curse. So it was a blessing because I was able to find somebody to work for 40 hours a week for $400 a month. And it was just like, that doesn't even seem like it's possible. Like that's almost like robbery, if you will. You almost feel guilty Um, about it. Yeah. And I actually offered more money to this person and they refused. They didn't want more money because in the Philippines – when you have a lot of money, you also have a bigger target on your back from all the corruption and other things that oh, happen over wow. there, which is really interesting. Yeah, that is sad. So with $400 a month, they were able to put a roof over their head, feed their kids, put them through school, et cetera. And it was like, wow, this is unbelievable. And they're mm-hmm. doing a lot of this work that is not on the top of my priority list, but needs to happen still. But the biggest levers often come from the things that you can do that you are also good at, but that you shouldn't do. And when you start handing off those things, that's where you get a ton of time back, right? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to have a person come in and like help you with your email or scheduling, you know, blog posts out for you. But when you can do something like, hey, I edit my show, now I'm going to have somebody else edit my show. I mean, that's where you buy hours of time back and a lot of mental bandwidth back um, to be able to then put into the marketing of your show instead or Mm -hmm. the business aspects of it, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, virtualstaffinder.com, and the other common one is uh, onlinejobs.ph. I will say, though, you cannot expect to hire somebody and then have it magically start working. You do have to train them. The best way to train somebody to do something that you do is to film a video of yourself doing it and just give it to them, a Loom video or, or however you want to do it. Mm-hmm. They just follow step by step. Here's how you publish a podcast episode. Do this, do this, do this. Here's your checklist. Boom. And, yes, you're kind of forced to create those when you train. But the beauty of that is, let's say that person leaves or you hire somebody on the team or whatever, you now have a SOP or standard operating procedure that you could share with somebody else to do to pick it up where they left off. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that process is beautiful and you can just start small. And if you're anything like me, you will start small and go, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing in the world. <laughs> and now I have a team of like 10 people who literally are working full time. The curse about working with a VA is uh, from the Philippines and uh, many other overseas countries is that they will do everything that you tell them to do and do it well and do it on time, but they will do nothing more. In Filipino culture especially, the worker never oversteps the boss. Mm. They will not suggest to do things better. They will not suggest uh, you know, anything beyond what it is that you tell them to do, right? Versus like, I wanted people in my company to feel like they took ownership in certain parts of it and could create themselves to Mm -hmm. kind of expand and and improve processes, which likely won't happen from a VA that you hire, but could happen from somebody like an integrator or or other business people that you might hire. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, We're coming up on an hour, and I didn't want to take you too much time out of your day, but... uh... There were there were a couple of things I wanted to hear about that's sort of on topic, and a couple of things that are not on topic. So I'll just, okay. I'll just throw we'll them at you, lightning there. round or something. Uh, but you've been doing this for a while, like you said, you're kind of one of the OGs, and you got the beard to prove it, um, <laughs> which is gray. fairly that's new. Yes, oh man, is. mine is so gray now. And it's, the problem with doing YouTube is like I I shoot a video of myself every week, and you can just see, you can just see oh, the aging. Do like happening. a time lapse, like. 
thing of like your beard and, and the seriously yeah. I, it's too depressing to do I, I i that's the reason why i haven't haven't done it i actually did a video on aging the uh, a couple of weeks back and i started to do that like just do like a ai morphing over the oh, years like or the, something they're like <laughs> yeah like yeah or, or the old. michael jackson black and white video or something at the end oh right right, right. um uh, i started to do that and then it just didn't happen but anyway <laughs> uh I wanted to ask what kind of changes you've seen in podcasting and content creation in the time that you've been doing it. Yeah, as far as like people starting new podcasts, the riches are in the niches. I found that people are more That's successful. Still true? The more, oh yeah, it's even okay. it's even more true because okay. there's just so much noise out there. We're all suffering yeah. from content bloat right now, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's playing content tourist, but we want to go deep, and so we need to like set up camp at an Airbnb somewhere versus just stay at the hotel for two days uh, to really get to know like this place or this content that we're creating, et cetera. So as opposed to like just ramming content down people's throats, like really getting honed in on, well, what are the challenges and who it is that we're serving and, and why? And again, coming from a place of service, the podcasting space has also evolved as far as like technology and mm -hmm. other companies and software and, and solutions that are coming out. I mean, every, you know, we see Spotify got into the podcasting space, obviously, but there's a lot of new tools coming out, even editing tools like Descript, all the way to uh, new hosts and dynamically inserted ads and all this stuff, it's it's exciting for mm -hmm. sure. We're also seeing a lot of advertisers, companies are realizing the power of podcasting and not treating it like, oh, you need 50,000 downloads in order for me to even have a conversation with you, but rather, hey, you have this amazing loyal tribe of a thousand people can we pay you to get in front of that audience? Because they know that the connection between the mm -hmm. podcaster and the podcast listener is just so strong, much stronger than initially a YouTube viewer and uh, it's the, the creator. Um, over time, then that surpasses because there's video and there's a lot more that you can get involved with, but the relationship with the podcast is great. Is great. And then you still have those very high retention rates in episodes, right? You have people listening for 30 minutes, an hour, more. Mm -hmm. Uh, versus uh, on video, um, the format is getting shorter and shorter, it seems. So, you know, that's just kind of my high level thoughts about what's happening in the podcasting space. But we're seeing uh, a lot more bigger companies, bigger names, bigger personalities get into the space as well. We're seeing a lot of uh, fiction podcasting coming about, um, you know, ever since, you know, 2013 and when like Serial came out, even though that yeah, was yeah. nonfiction. I mean, that, that made like crime uh, mm -hmm. its own sort of category That's huge absolutely huge right and i love that because the more that podcasts like that outside of my space bring new podcast listeners into podcasting space in general the more people who will eventually find our shows and that's mm -hmm. really special so i invite this and you know although it sounds and seems saturated it's definitely not there's still less than a million active podcasts out there and we're still in the very very early days of, of what it will become so it's exciting really think everybody's going to have their own podcast someday. Uh, and I know that some other content creators were a bit put off during the pandemic when a lot of um, really high level celebrities couldn't do their normal jobs anymore. So they created YouTube channels and created podcasts yeah. and stuff. And of course, because they had the exposure already, they were able to just sort of take off and, um, right, right. but kind of the way yeah. you just said that though, if, if that's bringing more eyeballs to the platform, then that's more eyeballs for you as oh, well. Exactly. That... You just got to be the one to then capture those people's attention somehow. Yeah. Um, most people on average, I think, subscribe to seven different podcasts. So you're not actually competing with them, right? Mm. What what you're competing with is just attention in the world. Uh, yeah. and, and that's yeah. what you need to figure out. Yeah. Um, and I also just want to give you a chance. Um, I, I was curious about the architecture thing, that that was something you used to do. Is it still something you're interested in? Or, or was it uh, something that was just a job and then you got away from it as soon as you can? Uh, I'm still interested in the field of architecture. Mm -hmm. I don't miss working in this, in this space, <laughs> though. That's for sure. It was just, you know, I have my fingerprint on several buildings around the United States, and nobody would ever know. And nobody ever cares. And, and why would they? Mm -hmm. Versus I could help a person uh, generate an extra $1,000 a month from one tweak in an email, and they're sending me and my family to Disneyland because they want to pay me back. Like, mm -hmm. that kind of recognition is, is there in this space, and I can have a bigger impact and deeper impact here than I can with architecture. Um, so I do miss parts of it, but I don't miss AutoCAD. I don't miss the politics. And it is very, very severely underpaid uh, when it comes into oh. the, to, to that sort of engineering world. Uh, it's probably the 
lowest paid of of like engineers and you know construction and all that kind of stuff like it's it's, it's one it's of those a prestigious really, job it's a prestigious but, really highly respected job but you're, you're right everybody i know that works in that field is they're miserable not getting paid well <laughs> <laughs> But that's such um, a Pat Flynn answer you just gave, because like a lot of people who go into architecture, it's, it is a lot about like, I can build this structure that will outlive me. You know, it's, it's like, it's sort of a monumental kind of thing, but, but you turned it around and were like, but I could, I could move other people and I can shape the world in that way. And that's more important to you. I think that's a very, Pat it is. I, 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 I want it. I want, I, I want to feel the effects of the people who I'm helping versus just building a shell that they live in. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, that's a good place to end because I wanted to wrap up by saying uh, I am one of the people that you inspired. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to straight up come out and say that. Like I, I went through a period there where I'd been working. Um, like I said, I had a filmmaking background, very difficult, you know, career choice. And uh, I wound up going into advertising. So I was working at a newspaper in an advertising uh, department. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was a job and it got me out of debt and it got me insurance and all that kind of stuff. But I was very unhappy there. So I started looking into anything and everything that could, um, you know, give me something more along the lines of the life that I wanted. And I stumbled onto your podcast and I ran into, you know, Tim Ferriss's work and everything. And I just consumed it. And uh, um, I don't want to give you too much credit because I still did a lot of work, but you know, you it was did all it was... the work. I'm just the guide, you know, and, and provided that spark, but you, you provided you the spark. It. Yeah. And, and you, you made it feel like it was something that could be done. And I know I'm one of just like thousands of people that feel the same way. So I just wanted to say mm -hmm. thank you right off the bat. Just like, Hey, thank you for that, Joe. That, that yeah. means a lot. And uh, I hope you and your viewers and listeners uh, get something out of this. And I'm looking forward to doing more with you in the future. This was super fun. We'd love to We'll go bass fishing. Let's go. And talk about Pokemon. I didn't get to Pokemon. I was curious what your whole thing with oh, that is. But. Yeah, maybe we could say that for later. But save it the, for later. The, 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 yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs>Okay, that was awesome. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that. Big thanks to Pat for spending some time with me. Again, his website is smartpassiveincome.com. It's loaded with greatness. So, I mean, I mean, if, there, if you're interested at all in setting up an online business, there's something there that will just make something click in your head and you'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe I even tried to do this without looking here first. But anyway, uh, you can go there. Plus he's got books. Go get smarter, go get more passive and go get uh, more income. How about that? This episode was produced by Kimmy Britt, edited by Bray Brown. I'm Joe Scott. You can find me at Answers with Joe pretty much everywhere on the socials. Of course, my YouTube channel is Answers with Joe. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Please do share this if you thought it was interesting. And a nice review on whatever podcast player you're listening to right now really goes a long way. So until next time, thanks. Have a good one. Now go out there and start some conversations of your own. Take care.